Broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi everybody, thanks for joining our webinar today on Turbulent Flow and CFD. I'll be starting it off in one minute from now. Okay, I'll get going now. Thanks for joining everyone today. We're going to be talking about CFD turbulent flow in the weekly webinar for Ozen Engineering. I'm Chris Cowan and I'll be giving the webinar today. First, a bit about Ozen Engineering. We are a company focused on simulation using ANSYS uh, software. Uh, we use uh, finite element analysis and computational fluid dynamics to solve multidisciplinary, multi-physics uh, projects and, and problems. Ozen Engineering, uh, this most recent year, I'd like to brag, was selected as the ANSYS Channel Partner of the Year uh, for North and South America, and in addition, we're certified as an ANSYS Elite Channel Partner. As a channel partner, what that means is that we provide software. We sell software in Northern California and Nevada. Uh, we provide technical support for our customers. We have training classes, which you can find listed on our website, and we provide engineering consulting services. So we can, even if you don't have ANSYS software, we can help you out and, and solve your project for you. We work with the full suite of ANSYS products, including structural mechanics, fluids, electromagnetics, high frequency and low frequency signal integrity, and a combination of all those above in multi-physics. ANSYS has recently added optics to the tool set of capabilities. Uh, we also work with virtual reality collaboration tool. It's like a virtual reality version for um, uh, equivalent to WebEx. And we offer cloud services. Ozen Engineering has the Ozen Cloud and we also offer ANSYS cloud services, which is a new, uh, a new product and capability that's been introduced recently and is being developed heavily. I'll talk more about that later. We do these webinars every week. Uh, you can see the list of previous webinars. We have recordings for all of these. They're available on our website. Uh, you can go to ozeninc.com slash webinar library uh, to access those. If you'd like to register for our newsletter, we'll send you a uh, calendar of them once a month, approximately. And uh, you can register for individual ones on our website at ozeninc.com slash training or on the ANSYS homepage under events. So... We'd like to work with you. We'd like to help you uh, be successful with ANSYS software. Please feel free to contact us. You can email 
phone or visit our website, submit a form there. I, uh, I'd also like to take this opportunity to note that we are looking to hire an electrical engineer. Uh, if you know any good candidates, please have them contact us. <clears throat> bit about me, my name is Chris Cowan. I'm Engineering VP here at Ozen Engineering. I've been working with uh, computer-aided engineering uh, with ANSYS specifically for the last uh, 14 years and, and uh, beyond that. And I've got my degrees from mechanical engineering and materials from UC Santa Barbara. Okay, so that's a bit about me and our company and now about turbulent flow. What we know is that turbulent flow is applicable for, a, I'd say, a large majority of the type of problems that we work with, for, for that engineers work with. Um, in or, so this, this presentation is mostly focused on ANSYS CFD. In specific, uh, when we see some graphical user interface screenshots, those are for Fluent, but this general knowledge on turbulence is equally applicable for CFX or any other CFD tool out there that, that enables uh, modeling turbulence. So the steps, we need to select a, a turbulence model, assume we need to understand first of all if turbulence is active, set a turbulence model, set boundary conditions for, for the inlets and outlets, decide what variation of the turbulence models we're going to use and how it treats uh, walls. So I'm going to cover all of those shortly. First, when we talk about uh, what is turbulence, when we talk about turbulence, we, we consider four primary characteristics. The first is that turbulence is unsteady. That means three-dimensional, irregular, uh, stochiastic motion. You never know where these eddies are going to be at any given moment, but you can um, kind of understand and average that out over time. Second is that a characteristic of turbulence is that it enhances mixing uh, of these, these quantities that are transported, mass, momentum, and scalar species uh, due, to these, due to these fluctuations, mixing is enhanced. So it's unsteady over time, and it's random. It's unpredictable. Last is that turbulent flow is characterized by eddy structures, these swirling patterns um, in various small sizes, large to small. Uh, sometimes you have, the, you have the capability to resolve them using eddy-type turbulence models. Uh, for most industrial applications, we're actually uh, using RANDs uh, to average them out to, to consider their average effects. So Osborne Reynolds uh, kind of pioneered the work in turbulence. We see cartoons here, uh, like a graphical display of what turbulence looks like. On the top, laminar flow. It's characterized by a Reynolds number, which we'll get into calculating uh, shortly. We can see how uh, fully developed turbulent flow looks with large swirling. Um, and then the, at the transition, as flow becomes turbulent from laminar, we can see kind of a small scale uh, swirling patterns developing. OK, so the first step in applying turbulence to your CFD model is judging, measuring whether your model actually requires turbulent flow. Is the flow turbulent? So how we do that is by calculating the Reynolds number. Reynolds number is a function of density, fluid density, velocity, characteristic length scale, and viscosity. Uh, it's hard to know uh, exactly, so you always want to perform this Reynolds number calculation in advance of your uh, solving your model, but it's hard really to know what is the velocity going to be, and in some cases these other variables as well, uh, because generally it's not really a uniform flow that you're going to be solving for. So 
sometimes you'll need to get a preliminary solution and then recalculate the Reynolds number to, um, to really understand the level of turbulence. The, so we, we, we do have these threshold values for Reynolds number. For external flow uh, along a surface, turbulent flow is characterized by Reynolds numbers greater than 500,000. External flow around an obstacle, Reynolds number greater than 20,000. And for internal flow, we see the transition around 2300. Reynolds number below 2300 would indicate likely laminar flow, and above 2300 would indicate turbulent flow. Computational approaches. So there's different ways to solve for turbulence. There's direct numerical simulation, which is solving the full unsteady Navier-Stokes equation. This is less of an industrial application and more of a research uh, university type application in general because the cost is too prohibitive. It requires an extremely fine mesh. We start talking about mesh sizes in the hundreds of millions to billions. Um, so more practical would be large eddy simulation, which is used in some industrial applications uh, where the eddies are resolved. Um, but even most applicable, I'd say, would be RANS, Reynolds Average Navier-Stokes where we're, and you can see graphically the difference between these where the eddies are resolved for DNS and LES, but the equivalent behavior is considered for this time averaging of the, the mixing and turbulent uh, characteristics. Reason why it's most widely used in industry is simply you can get good, accurate results uh, for a efficient solution, I'll say. It doesn't, it doesn't require, um, doesn't necessarily require a transient solution and it doesn't necessarily require uh, extremely fine grid. Turbulent models available and fluent. There's one equation models, there's two equation models which are generally most widely used. Reynolds stress models, there's, uh, and more, uh, more advanced transition models, and even more advanced uh, versions of large eddy simulation, like detached eddy, stress blended. Um, so the most, uh, the most widely used are the K-epsilon and the K-omega family. Generally, the guidelines from ANSYS would recommend that K omega, the SST version, is recommended for most situations. It's, it has, we'll talk about this more later, but it has more computationally intensive requirements to resolve the boundary layer uh, associated with the Y plus requirements, but it gives the most accurate solutions uh, for a reasonable computation time, especially in situations with flow separation and conjugate heat transfer. For situations where your compute capabilities don't enable you to use the K-Omega SST model, you can save some compute by working with the K-Epsilon uh, the different variations of those. I guess that your, your second best choice might be K-Epsilon realizable, and the reason why that saves you some com compute time and meshing uh, effort is that the Y-plus requirements are not as rigorous or not as strict. Uh, you can use Y-plus up to somewhere between 30 to 300 as as compared to K-Omega SST, which would require Y-plus at 1, and that's the relative thickness of the first cell of your domain uh, away from the wall. 
Now, practical approach. This is we're looking at the graphical user interface for Fluent here um, on how to set the turbulence models. We can see the various models that are available. There's a lot of them, and then and different options under each one. To get started, I just say the K Omega SST, as we discussed previously, was is your recommended choice specifically if you're interested in the flow characteristics near the wall and particularly applications where, where you're interested in flow characteristics near the wall would be conjugate heat transfer and flow separation. For, uh, for uh, problems where you're less interested directly near the wall, then it's, it's likely you can get accurate results um, just using the K-Epsilon, a little bit more simple K-Epsilon model. So we've been talking about the boundary layer. What we have here is a graph showing how the velocity increases as the distance uh, from the wall increases. When we think about turbulence, we usually use this data, but presented in a different way with log scales uh, and dimensionless uh, log axes and dimensionless numbers. So we're thinking more about this chart here. The smaller x-axis values show the, show the uh, distance away from the wall uh, versus velocity. And what we see here is there's two distinct regions, the near wall region and then the uh, farther away from the wall. And depending on the turbulence model that we select, those are treated differently. Either the results are resolved in the near wall region or they are uh, specified using wall functions. So uh, in that near wall, nearest to the wall, we consider uh, the region would be called the viscous sublayer and it's linear velocity with distance away from the wall. Uh, and we're going to talk about the, the kind of two different approaches in more detail on how to treat that region. So as I said previously, you can use wall functions or you can resolve. When you resolve, you need, you need well, in both, in both cases, you need to pay attention to the size of your first layer of boundary layer inflation. Boundary layer inflation, of course, is uh, where the elements at the surface are kind of extruded away from the surface at specific thicknesses, uh, a specific number of them, and a specific increase in thickness for each successive layer. These are choices that you make in your meshing application. Uh, and the the um, the mesh approach that you select is what determine it should correspond whether you're using wall functions or viscous sublayer. Uh, on on the topic of meshing, you have different tools with ANSYS. There's ANSYS meshing, which has been probably the primary tool that most people would use for meshing uh, historically for Fluent or CFX. And recently, Fluent has introduced a new single uh, window meshing workflow within Fluent, the Fluent Mesher, which is a nice tool because, for a couple of reasons. One of them is that the type of mesh that it creates. It creates, it, it enables a, an entirely polyhedral mesh or a mosaic mesh. Uh, mosaic is a combination of hex core at the kind of center body and polyhedral at the boundary layer inflation and connecting through the body up to the hex core. The purpose of that is that it's faster, more efficient solution. The other purpose is that these polyhedral elements 
enable higher element quality. So if you've ever had problems with your CFD solution associated with element quality, either orthogonal quality or skewness um, or expansion factor, those, the element type polyhedral and of course X-Core uh, really diminishes that as a problem for you. So um, I, if, if you make, if you prepare complicated meshes, I'd urge you to give fluent meshing a try. I think you'll be happy with what you see. One of the other benefits is that it has parallelized mesh generation. So you can really speed up your mesh generation process uh, using fluent meshing. Okay, back to the turbulence. Uh, first approach would be wall functions. Uh, what it does is it uh, characterizes this predictable dimensionless boundary layer profile um, um, using the wall functions. As far as practical application, the first cell needs to be located in the log layer. There's, uh, how do you measure that? It's with a Y plus value. It's, uh, it measures the, it, it's a, one of these dimensionless numbers that measures the thickness of the first cell related to the material properties and the velocity. And the requirements here are that you have that first cell Y plus between 30 and 300. There's a couple approaches to this. You can, after you have a solution, you can always post-process the Y plus value at the wall and you'll get a exact understanding of what it is. And based on that information, you might need or would likely need to go back into meshing and refine your mesh to make sure that you're within the requirements to get an accurate solution. Uh, that, that's my preferred approach. An alternate approach is you can uh, my, my, I guess I'll, I'll give more detail. My preferred approach would be this. Make kind of a best guess at Y plus value um, prior to solving the problem. Solve a coarse version of the model. Post process to understand what your, what your actual Y plus value is. And then go back, improve your mesh, and adjust your inflation parameters to produce the Y plus value exactly that you're looking for uh, now that you know the actual velocity of the fluid flowing through the system. Alternately, you can do a hand calculation in advance to predict the, the first layer of thickness to give a Y plus that you need, or there's various uh, nice tools actually available on, on the internet. You can just do a Google search for something like Y plus calculator, and, and based on the material properties, and the velocity, uh, this web-based calculators will give you a predicted Y plus thickness, for cell thickness, and also um, calculate your Reynolds number for you. Okay. So, uh, a more accurate approach to solving the problem would be to resolve the viscous sublayer. In this case, uh, I mentioned the one of the main challenges here is is mesh com, uh, computation with a more finely resolved mesh. Uh, viscous sublayer requires a Y plus closer to one. Uh, something near two is probably okay. You don't want to really go much below one, or else you're wasting computation. But right around one is your goal, and uh, it's important that the growth rate is about 1.2. You don't want to go that this 1.2 is a specification that you make in your meshing application, and you don't want each successive layer to grow by more than 20% uh, as a way to ensure that you can really resolve with accuracy the flow in in these low Reynolds regions. So, uh, as we see, generally speaking, if forces or heat transfer on the wall are key to your simulation, uh, then this uh, resolving the viscous layer, sublayer is the approach that you want, you're going to want to take using the SSTK Omega, um, especially for heat transfer, like conjugate heat transfer, aerodynamic drag, calculating coefficient of lift and drag, for instance, and turbo machinery blade performance. We have here 
uh, chart of the the boundary layer, what the velocity of the boundary layer, what the velocity of the boundary layer looks like, and then the mesh resolution comparison for wall functions on the left side versus uh, uh, re uh, resolving this viscous sublayer uh, uh, with a more refined mesh. So for the wall function, we see that the the first cell boundary is somewhere near the log log region that that, that we saw in the previous charts. Um, whereas there's uh, several cells at lower distances, lower thicknesses from that log region where we're resolving the viscous sublayer. Y plus for the SST and K omega models. Uh, those models were formulated to be near wall resolving where the viscous sublayer is resolved, and to take advantage of that, the Y plus should be around one, and that's necessary for accurate predictions for flow. Uh, they can use a coarser near wall mesh, um, and and if your mesh is more coarse that, that doesn't meet these Y plus requirements, this turbulence model will take advantage of wall functions instead of resolving. Um, but uh, as we note here, the advantages that we seek in using these models with the correct Y plus will be lost. We see an example here of a situation where wall functions are not sufficient to accurately solve the problem. Uh, on the left side, uh, flow ar around an airfoil with no separation, we, we would generally say that wall functions are sufficient to solve that problem with a good degree of accuracy. When the angle of attack of that airfoil changes such that there's flow separation with recirculation, then we start to think that wall functions are less applicable and we would want to resolve the viscous sublayer as a way to make a more accurate prediction about the location of separation and the recirculating behavior downstream. Okay. So, turbulence settings for near wall modeling. Uh, when we're using the K omega model, if we selected the K omega model here, we don't need to make a specification for near wall treatment. For the K epsilon model, we have various options for the near wall treatment. Uh, if, if you're using wall functions, then your kind of least robust approach would be standard wall functions. You can avoid some problems by using scalable wall functions, and you can also choose enhanced wall treatment. Um, these are uh, using this approach. Uh, it's Y plus insensitive. It will resolve. You can you can resolve um, the near wall flow using enhanced wall treatment, and if the mesh is not, does not meet the Y plus requirements, then, then the K epsilon model will use the wall functions even if enhanced wall treatment is specified. So that's, we've, we've been talking about the types of models that are available and the mesh requirements and the settings for those models. Another important thing to consider when you're running turbulent CFD models is to set the inlet boundary condition. When flow enters your domain, you want to start off with the appropriate turbulence level in that flow. And that's not necessarily an easy thing to do. It's, it's kind of hard to know um, what is your turbulence level at the inlet. So there's different ways of uh, of specifying it, one is you can specify turbulence intensity and viscosity ratio. 
that's the default that's available in, in Fluent and CFX. And the default values would be turbulent intensity, 5%, viscosity, viscosity ratio, 10. Uh, if you don't know a lot about the turbulent conditions at your inlet, it would be generally recommended to stick with these. Alternate approaches that you have are turbulence intensity and length scale, uh, turbulence intensity and hydraulic diameter, and then you can explicitly specify uh, K, E, and W, kinetic energy, eddy, dissipation, and omega. Uh, one nice thing that this allows is a profile definition. So if you have a, space, a spatial distribution of turbulence, you might have solved a separate model upstream or kind of a more global model and you might be working on a, a more, I'll say the term sub-model, where you know, where you have a good idea about these turbulence properties, then you can specify them in a profile definition. If you have no idea of turbulence levels, you could use the following values. Um, kind of a medium value would be 5% intensity with 10% viscosity. 10% viscosity is good for internal or external flows. It's kind of right in between those situations. Uh, so you can, if, if you kind of suspect it's lower, turbulence magnitudes at the inlet, you can reduce those numbers or you can increase them. Um, alternately, you might want to have a more accurate knowledge about turbulence conditions near your region of interest. My advice in that situation is that you should probably expand your domain. If you don't have a good idea about the turbulence at your inlet and you want to have a good measure of turbulence at your inlet, you should probably expand your domain, move your inlet upstream farther to a place where you think you can make this general guess and then solve some as the flow proceeds through some distance of your domain so that you get a better answer in the, your region of interest. Okay, in summary for turbulence modeling guidelines, first step you want to do, calculate the Reynolds number and to uh, enable you to determine whether the flow is turbulent. Uh, I'll note that you can post-process some turbulence values, and in CFX, the solver will output in the solve output a, a calculated Reynolds number, but it's that's uh, I wouldn't trust that. Um, I wouldn't take that to be exact for your situation. It's a difficult number to calculate, mostly because of making the judgment about the characteristic length scale. So it's something that you're going to want to do manually, uh, and that's an easy calculation to, ma to make. Okay, after you know the Reynolds number, you know that your flow is turbulent, you're going to decide on the near wall modeling strategy. You can resolve the viscous sublayer, or you can use wall functions. When you know uh, and that choice is really based on the category of problem you're solving. Is the flow characteristics at the walls important, uh, very important, or, or less important for your problem? So that enables you to make that choice. And then based on how you're going to be uh, resolving that viscous sublayer or, or, or using wall functions, you generate your mesh with the Y plus value suitable for the selected approach. You can predict in advance what the Y plus will be using something like a web calculator or back of the envelope calculation. Uh, alternately, you can make a best guess and solve and then post process what your actual Y plus is and use that to refine your mesh and then continue the solution. It's a nice, uh, one, one nice capability of CFD is that you can stop a solution, make changes, and then continue it by interpolating from previous results. <clears throat> okay, the next step in working with turbulence is to choose a turbulence model uh, and potentially, if applicable, a near wall treatment. Uh, for fluent, it's within the viscous panel. For CFX, it's within the domain, like a, a tab of the domain specifications. 
ANSYS recommends to generally use SST K Omega. It's, it will give you good accuracy for most industrial cases. If, uh, if you're having convergence difficulties with SST K Omega, which, which I wouldn't necessarily say is something that you would, should expect, then you can try BSL K Omega or Realizable K Epsilon. And then the last task associated in working with turbulence would be to set reasonable boundary conditions for turbulence at inlets. Uh, generally, you want, you, you, your best bet is probably just to use the default settings unless you know more. And if you're not satisfied about the accuracy with that, then you might, then you should probably expand your domain to, to set the inlet further away from the region of interest. Okay, some additional information that I wanted to provide is about the generalized K omega model we call Gecko, generalized K omega. This is a, a new turbulence capability from ANSYS that's been introduced in, in the last year. Uh, what it does is it allows the user to tune it simplifies the process of tuning the turbulence model. There's these four free coefficients uh, corresponding to pop, uh, particular flow characteristics, meaning separation behavior, free shear flow spreading rates, uh, changes of near wall behavior, and then free jet flows. So the benefit is it allows the use of a single turbulence model for various applications. And in this next slide here, I will show you an example of uh, airfoil calculation with Reynolds number 2e to the 6. This is a comparison of experimental data, which we see in the, um, the circular data points here, calculating coefficient of lift, coefficient of performance, and the blue line that we see here is the comparison of the SST turbulence model versus experimental data. And you can see that in, in some regions, it's not uh, comparing as well as we would like. And the point of using Gecko is that you can adjust some parameters to improve the fit uh, with experimental data. So we see how um, varying one of those coefficients between 1.752 and 2.5 enables the simulation data to improve the fit with the experimental data. So you can always look into Gecko as a, a turbulence model as well. Last thing I'd like to add is that the ANSYS has recently started offering cloud services. This is, uh, this is built in natively, or not yet natively, it's built in through ACTs into the applications. Currently it's applicable for Fluent CFD and ANSYS Mechanical. And the intention is to give users easy access to on-demand HPC, parallel processing capabilities. Um, so if you need burst capacity where you have your own equipment, but occasionally you need more powerful hardware to solve your problems, then the cloud is a good option to consider. There's a lot of development going on in the cloud right now, and uh, eventually you'll see uh, more of these ANSYS products available, like CFX, um, electromagnetics, uh, and currently it's solve only with some post-processing, some simplified post-processing capabilities. Eventually it will be pre, uh, so full workflow, pre-process, full post-process in addition to solve. Uh, it's a solution that's really tuned for the latest release. It, it works well with your ANSYS software. And if you're interested in exploring this more, 
I will encourage you to call us up and our accounts team can set you up with the free one month trial. And I'll say the compute capabilities with this are quite impressive. There's different levels of compute capability. Right now, I think it's three basic levels. At the lower level would be, I think it's something like a 16, either 12 or 16 cores with probably something around 128 gigabytes of RAM. I forget the numbers off my head, off the top of my head, sorry. Uh, there's a medium, which is probably somewhere around 64 cores. And then there's a large solution, which is somewhere around 128 or 256 cores. Uh, but anyway, if you're interested in getting more, please contact us and our accounts team, and I can give you more information on that. So in closing, I'd like to say thank you for joining us for this webinar. I hope you've got a better understanding of how to incorporate working with Turbulent Flow to solve your models. And uh, if anybody has any questions, I can take that. I can take those now and, and, and try to help you out. Uh, otherwise, please check out our website. If, uh, we'll be having more. We haven't released our more lengthy webinar schedule for, for the upcoming months yet, but we'll be doing that. And um, if you're ever interested in talking with us about ANSYS software, or if you have a consulting project, uh, we will be more than happy to speak with you about that. So if you have any questions, please feel free to let me know. I don't see any questions in, so I guess I covered everything with a great level of uh, detail. So I will wrap up this webinar now. Thanks, everyone, for joining. Have a great day.